Now, anyone who was in Blackpool on the weekend the illuminations were switched off at the end of the summer season may be able to help police working on our next case. It was like our first case, Guy Fawkes Weekend. That Saturday, the 5th of November, was the last day anyone saw 74-year-old Harry Howell alive. Two weeks later, his body was found in the living room of his flat. He'd been robbed and killed. Harry's wife, Elsie, died just four weeks earlier. And since then, he seems to have been a rather lonely figure, living by himself in sheltered accommodation for elderly people in Blackpool. Our reconstruction, which includes actors as well as actual witnesses, begins back in October at Elsie's funeral, where a nephew was particularly concerned about him. Have you thought about what you're going to do now? Oh, I'll, I'll manage. I've, uh, I've got a fair bit put away, you know. No, I don't mean. I mean, how are you going to cope? Oh, I'll manage somehow. Well, what about your meals? Well, we'll think of some of Shortly after Elsie's funeral, Harry's nephew took him to the Leagate Cafe in Central Drive, very near Harry's home. Hello, love. This is Harry. He just lives round back in. He's had a bereavement, you know, his wife's died. So he'll be coming in here every day now for his meals, mm -hmm. and I'd like you to look after him. Make sure he has a substantial meal, well, we'll at least one a day. Yeah. No sandwiches or nothing like that. No, no. Harry had suffered a stroke which partly paralysed him, and he was blind in one eye. But he was an independent type, and he enjoyed placing a bet and having a pint. He used to carry a large amount of money in his wallet, and he made a point of telling people he was well off. Recently, he'd been going to the George pub around the corner from his home. Police would like to know of anyone seen talking to him there. Harry lived in sheltered accommodation in Ibbison Court, where every morning the warden visits the elderly residents. It's Saturday the 5th of November. I see you've got your flat nice and tidy now, mm. Harry. I see you've got your flat nice and tidy oh, now, Oh, Harry. yes, fine. Yes. Have you got rid of all Elsie's things? Mm. A social worker came round and, and took them away for somebody more needy like. Yes, yes. OK, love. Right. All right, then. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. The warden left Harry at half past nine that morning. An hour later, he was having his breakfast at the Leagate Cafe as usual. The waitress remembers serving a well-dressed man she hadn't seen before. 20 pence, is it? Thank you very much. You just listen there to Mike Lancaster, our reporter, who's over there at the moment at the British Gas Showroom in Blackburn, cooking for bonfire night tonight. The two men talked together for a while. Yeah, sure. If I knew he was with you, I would have brought the tea down myself. Oh, never mind, love. Take your tea out of that, will you? It's already paid. Police would like this man to come forward. Okay, don't worry. Hello, uh, I'm coming for a couple of meat sandwiches for an old man that comes here regular every day. Uh, perhaps you know him. This is Burton's Bakery on Central Drive, where Harry usually bought a pie at lunchtime. That's all we've got left. Oh, I won't want the salad. He definitely said meat. Uh, in that case, I'd better take the, uh, the beef and horse ready, please. Horse ready. you like one or two? Uh, two, please. Yeah. Two weeks later, two beef and horseradish sandwiches were found unopened in Harry's flat, still in the paper bag. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. These were the only beef sandwiches the bakery sold on the 5th of November. From the description the shop assistant has been able to give, police have produced this video fit of the man. It's obviously vital to their inquiries that he comes forward. I lost my wife recently. Harry enjoyed chatting to people. On that Saturday afternoon at about four o'clock, he kept these complete strangers talking for nearly 20 minutes. I'm no worries on that score. I I've uh, plenty of money stashed away, you oh, know. You? Oh, I, I, I'll be all right. Oh, 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 that's not fair, is it? Oh, no. Uh, uh, I'd like a dog, but I can't have one where I live, you know. You can't. <laughs> no, that'd keep the yobbos away, wouldn't it? Right, yeah. <laughs> Harry didn't mix much with the other residents in Ibbison Court, and no one knows whether he spent Guy Fawkes' night alone or not. On Sunday morning, the milkman delivered Harry's usual pint. The 
The warden uses an internal intercom to check residents on Sundays, and that morning she remembers Harry answered and said he was fine. Next day, on Monday, the warden on her usual rounds noticed a piece of white card stuck to Harry's door. It was the system residents used to signify they'd gone out for a while. On Tuesday, the 8th of November, at around half past seven, the milkman called again. The white card was still in the door glass. About an hour later, the home help sent by the social services arrived. She was the first to see a note, something like this, addressed to the milkman. But the milkman hadn't seen it. Half an hour after that, the deputy warden passed by on the regular round. She too remembers seeing a note. The window cleaner who came round that afternoon didn't see a note. So what had happened to it? As he worked, the window cleaner saw a man go up to Harry's door. He didn't get a reply and after a while walked off. On Thursday, four days after the warden had last heard Harry's voice, the milkman called again. Seeing Tuesday's bottle still there, he assumed Harry had gone away without telling him and took it away. It wasn't until 12 days later that it was realised something was wrong. On Tuesday, the 22nd of November, the window cleaner came round again. He was the first person to notice that Harry's door had been damaged, although it was still firmly locked. Concerned, the window cleaner went to the back to investigate. He saw Harry's body lying in an armchair in the lounge. And Harry died of terrible head wounds. Mr Hacking, it's extraordinary that nobody saw the damage to the door for nearly two weeks. That's right, yes. Mr Johnson, the window cleaner, was the first person to see it, but uh, there's quite a bit of damage. It looks very much like there's been a burglary, but of course the damage could have been caused afterwards in order to cover up a burglary. If it is burglary, there was certainly quite a lot stolen. For a start, there was a quite distinctive watch, wasn't there? That's right, yes. Um, he had this watch, Mr Howell. It belonged actually to his lifelong companion, Elsie Flegg. And on, on the watch, he's printed the words presented to Harry Flegg on his retirement, a word to that effect. It's a gold watch with a gold rim and is quite valuable. And some the keys were stolen, weren't they? In addition, there were keys to the home were stolen as well, about 12 keys on a bunch. Right, and the brown wallet? That's Some, right. Something similar to the one you had uh, there? Uh, a wallet similar to this was also stolen. It's uh, just an ordinary brown fold-over type wallet. And um, we know that in that wallet, Mr Howell has in the past kept several hundred pounds. Right. What about this note? It's a complete mystery. It was pinned to the door probably for only half an hour. Who wrote it? Who put it there and why? That's right, yes. It was, it was seen there on Tuesday, the 8th of November. It was either put there by Mr Howell or by his killer. Now, the indications are that Mr Howell didn't put it there. There was no indication that he was going away anywhere. He hasn't put notes of that sort there before. So, in, in all probability, it was the person who was connected with Mr Howell's death who put that note there. Right. Now, we're looking in particular for two men. The man, first of all, who went into Burton's Bakery that Saturday for a, some beef and horseradish sandwiches for an old man, as he said. Could we have his description? That's right, yes. The, the man who went into Burton's Bakery, he was quite a tall man. He was, he was slim. Uh, with a pale drawn face uh, with dark hair that fell over his face, over his forehead. And the second man was the man seen on the morning of that same day talking to Harry in the cafe as he ate his breakfast. That's right, yes. This man seen in the cafe with Mr Howell, he again was quite tall. He was described as broadish built, but he was wearing 
um, a fawn coloured overcoat with a trilby hat, with a soft trilby hat. Right, there's always a possibility that's the same man. I hope there you get that. lots of calls, Mr Hacking. Thank you very much. If you can help Detective Superintendent Hacking with any information on this case, please do call. Perhaps you saw Harry or chatted to him at the Leagate Cafe or at the George Pub. The number here is 01811 or the direct line to the incident room in Blackpool is 0253 293933. That's 0253 293933. That as well. Now, if you can think back to two weeks before Christmas, were you in North London, perhaps driving through Stoke Newington? Stoke Newington is on the A10, one of the main roads to the city from the north. On Sunday, December the 11th, you might have noticed that an estate agent was open in Evering Road. Or maybe you knew the proprietor, Lionel Webb. A Barbadian by birth, he'd lived most of his life in Birmingham, then moved down to London in 1985. On that Sunday, at around the close of business, with the lights in his office blazing, Lionel was murdered in full view of the street. Lionel had become a familiar face in Stoke Newington. He'd moved his business here from Edgware in October, and for weeks before that, he'd been supervising the refitting of the shop. Locals say even then he was scouting for new properties to buy. Excuse me. Hi, I'm uh, Lionel Webb from the Property Developers Next Door. I was wondering if you uh, ever wanted to sell. Well, I bought this a year ago as an investment. How much? Well, 36. Well, I'd be more than willing to double that to 75, 80. Mm. Yeah? Well, listen. Think about it and give us a call. I will. Okay? Take care. Bye. Bye. His plans were to acquire the whole row of houses around his office on Evering Road, opposite St Paul's Church. Five days before his death, on Tuesday the 6th of December, a white Datsun van was noticed parked outside Lionel's office. The witness remembers a man with a large hook nose and a tattoo on his hand. Was this you, or do you know who it was? Lionel worked seven days a week, and at 9am on the fateful day, Sunday the 11th of December, he set off from his home in Mill Hill. He was carrying a briefcase and a black plastic bag. About 11 o'clock on that Sunday morning, a man wearing a dark woolly hat got out of a red car and went into Lionel's office. Then there's a gap in sightings. Where did Lionel go that morning? Because about two hours later, at 1.30, he was seen returning to his office. And he was seen to look up and down the road before entering. Then, it seems, he took a shower. A short while later, the woman who owned the corner property came round. She'd decided to accept Lionel's offer, but he'd failed to call her back. Where have you been? I waited in all day for you on Thursday to contact me. Yes, ma'am, sorry. I've got the money and the deal can go through, OK? Cash? 80,000. When? Come here tomorrow, we can sign the papers. OK. See you. Talk to you soon. OK, take care. About an hour later, at around 2.30, a man in his 50s or 60s was seen in Lionel's office. He was dressed in a smart trilby hat and grey checkered overcoat. Then, at about 3 o'clock, Lionel's secretary turned up. Hi. Oh, hello. What are you doing here? Just had a row with my boyfriend. Surprised he stayed so long. What do you mean? Was he ever done to you? Nothing. You're in a strange mood. Well, wouldn't you be if you had debts like mine? Well, everybody's got debts today. What? Oh, 2,000 to this person, 20,000 to that person. Come on, how am I going to pay that? Don't worry, something will turn up. Yeah, like what? I don't know, something will. Relax. Lionel had promised to help his secretary buy a car, and she'd arranged for one to be brought round at four o'clock. Nice. Really nice. The car owner told the police that Lionel offered just under £4,000, but asked him to wait till the end of the week for the cash. 
An hour later, at 10 to 5, a passing motorist saw two white men in Lionel's company. At half past five, a local handyman called in. He'd worked on Lionel's office. It's time you went home. Like you haven't got a home to go to. <laughs> Sometime round then, Lionel rang a friend, but she remembers he had nothing much to say. You going to college tomorrow? Then she heard rustling in the background. Yeah, well, take care. Everything will be all right. Around the same time, two witnesses stopped briefly to look at the notices in the window. They clearly remember seeing a man in a dark suit and tie sitting at the desk, but they're confident it was not Lionel. Then a black hatchback was seen to speed away from Evering Road. When the handyman returned, he found Lionel's door ajar. Bill Cutts, why? What was the motive? Well, maybe robbery. Um, there's a, a briefcase and £4,000 that uh, we never recovered, that we know he had. Or, it more likely, is a gangland revenge killing over drugs or money deals. Now, what's the link with drugs? Well, in the back of the shop, after the, the killing, the police arrived, they found two kilos of cannabis resin. Each kilo was wrapped in a clear cellophane packet. At Eddie's home in North London was a large quantity of amphetamine-based tablets. We must make it clear that we will treat with great discretion anybody who calls into the studio if they've had any dealings with drugs. Uh, but if it's of a minor nature, the police really aren't going to be interested in that. This is a murder inquiry. Now, of the people who were represented in the film, obviously you need everyone to come forward if, if they think that they were represented there. The white man with the hook nose and the, the tattoo. That was on his left hand, wasn't it? On his left hand, yes, just between the, uh, the forefinger and thumb. And it definitely said mum, no question about no that. No doubt about it. That's pretty distinctive, and you obviously need him to come forward to eliminate himself or anybody else who knows him. Then there was uh, a black man in a very smart suit sitting at Lionel's desk. Yes, this was about 5.30, 5.45 in the evening of, uh, of the Sunday the 11th. Right, and the witness is convinced that wasn't Lionel. Yes, they're most certain that it wasn't the same man. OK, there's a black uh, hatchback car again. There's another clue you saw screeching away at the, uh, at the end of around the time of the murder. If that was you and you had nothing to do with this murder, for heaven's sake, come forward. And I also gather you've got some more evidence, literally in the last 24 hours, uh, about a 10-year-old girl. That's right. A passing murderess has just come forward uh, 24 hours ago and told us that you saw a 10-year-old girl walking past the shop at about quarter to six, which is the most important time, around about the time of Lionel's death. Well, obviously, uh, there aren't very many 10-year-old girls or girls of that age watching this programme. But if you are the parent in Stoke Newington of a girl, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, who could have been in Evering Road on Sunday, the 11th of December at 6 o'clock or thereabouts, please do call us. Here's the number to the studio if you can help with any of these, 01 811 Alternatively, you can try the incident room, that's 01 488 5212. 01 488 5212. Now to Bristol and what may have been the most callous form of crime, a murder for the hell of it. A man who was a harmless, hopeless al alcoholic was hit on the head for no known motive. Police fear the killer or killers might strike again. It happened on the night before January's crime watch, Wednesday, January the 11th. Were you in Bristol then? Our reconstruction begins in the city centre near the Broadmead shopping area. Radio Bristol News. It's nine o'clock. This is Norman Rickard. The Civil Aviation Authority has ordered new safety checks following the M1 plane disaster on Sunday night. The Stokes Croft Roundabout is a popular meeting place for the city's homeless. They call it the Magic Roundabout. One of the regulars was Mickey. He never ate much from one week to the next. Drink. That's as much as he did from one bottle to the next. It was mostly cider, but when funds were low, they had been known to drink meths, and lately he was drinking cider with Dettol. Mickey came from Stoke Gifford, not far from Bristol, and he'd worked in various labouring and farming jobs. This is him seven years ago at his sister's wedding. His parents had both died, as had his handicapped brother. Mickey lived with his sister for a time, but started drinking heavily, and soon afterwards left home. Because he stooped, he looked noticeably short and was known as Mickey Mouse, or Metal Mickey. He was only 33, but he seemed older. Mickey was really a very ordinary sort of chap. 
obviously his life had been blighted by alcohol. We'd known him for well, five and a half years. And in that time, we'd seen him deteriorate physically and obviously deteriorate. His trousers were always longer than his legs and under the, under the heels of his shoes. Um, very shuffling gait. Uh, as his physical condition deteriorated, his, his walking became worse and worse. Mickey was a nice popular chap. Um, I remember in particular when one night I was doing the night shelter, I'd lost my purse. And Mickey was the first chap to offer me 50 pence for my bus fare home in the morning. And thereafter, whenever I saw him, he would always give 20p, 30p, whatever change he had for our funds. He used to use our night shelter a couple of times a week, but more recently he tended to skip her. That means sleeping rough wherever you can find a place. The Sunday before he died, it was quite obvious that he and the little group that he moved around with had been on quite a binge for several days. On the day he died, I'd gone over to the charity shop oh, sometime after two o'clock in the afternoon and I noticed from the window that on the bit of waste ground there was a fire which was blazing you know, quite, quite bright and quite strongly. Oi! Hey, you two! Put that out! It's dangerous! Mickey was lying on the ground. Shortly afterwards, another witness remembers seeing Mickey and talking to his friend. Hey, darling. What, 10 p for a cup of tea? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, there you oh, go. Yeah. Okay. Oh, cigarette. Yeah. You got another cigarette for me, mate. There you go. Oh, God All bless right. you, Hey, Mickey. Got Siggy for you. Maybe Mickey left the fire. A social worker is convinced she spoke to him 10 minutes walk away. Um, I actually saw him as, as I was leaving about half past four as the day centre was closing and we had a, a chat and he was playing around with my lights, pretending to switch them on and off and that was the last time I saw him. Later, back in Picton Street, this witness, who'd known Mickey for 12 years, remembers seeing him lying dangerously close to the fire. There are several popular restaurants in this part of Montpellier did you pass through the area that night? A couple on their way to a meal recall hearing a muffled argument on the waste ground. The fire appeared to have gone out. Then at about 10.30, something unusual happened. You're a taxi? Yes. Have you got a radio? Yes. We'll phone the police quick. I want them three men arrested. Who were they and who was the woman? The driver only called the police the following morning. Shortly afterwards, the couple walked back from their meal. Strange place to keep down for the night. There was only one man now, and he was lying flat on his back. Next morning, Mickey was found dead. But now his body was on top of the remains of the fire. He'd been battered on the head. Later that morning, the police received an anonymous phone call. Force communications. Yes. Picton Street, yes. The caller said he'd seen two men hurrying away from the waste ground at about 10.45 the previous night. The two are described as in their mid-twenties, one about five foot ten tall, while the other was shorter and stockier. Police urgently need that caller and the men to contact them. I feel very much it's a tragedy that we all share in. We're part of a society that, that pushes alcohol at people and then despises the folk who, who can't handle it. Uh, Mickey was that sort of person. And I would just be concerned that people don't think, oh, it's a tramp, it's a drunk, you know, it's not important. It's very important. Ray Sargentson, why would anyone do this? Well, it's a wicked motorist murder. All I can think is somebody's done it for kicks. And this is a man who had nothing, caused no harm to anybody, and in spite of his lifestyle, certainly didn't deserve to die in the way that he did. If it was young men out after pub closing time who went in for a bit of tramp bashing, as you suspect, that anonymous caller, who was obviously public spirit enough to, to recognise that he might have seen something important, he could be absolutely key to this investigation. Well, I think he could well be the key, because from our other inquiries, we are fairly confident that he, in fact, saw the killers leaving the site. Now, he rang you on the Thursday morning, that's, that's the 12th of January. 
It's a long time ago, but you badly want to get in touch with him again now. Yes, we do. He's a very public-spirited gentleman. He rang in, he's given us good information. We'd like him to be just a little bit more public-spirited and ring us with his name and address. Now, what about those three men who were seen running away, the woman running after them? Were they involved? Well, we don't know. We're very anxious to trace her as well. She's in the scene, very close to where the body was found. It's vital that we find her. She may well have seen the killers doing something to Mickey, or it may be innocuous. But until we've got rid of her, then we really do need to get a uh, hold of her and find out what she's got to say. OK, so if that was you who called the taxi driver and said, please get the police, please ring us now, 01811 8055. Also, if it was you running away, Frankly, I take it you're not interested in minor misdemeanours. This is, this is a murder inquiry. That's right. I mean, innocuous sort of high larking, sky larking, mucking about is not of our interest. We're trying to trace the killers of Michael Fahey. The taxi driver said there were a lot of people around that, that time on that night. 35 people, maybe. Yes, we've traced a lot of people, but clearly we've got a lot of unidentified people seen in the street by persons who have come forward, and I do anxiously urge anybody who was in the area, even if they feel they saw nothing, to come forward and help. OK, the date is Wednesday the 11th of January. The time is 10.30 to 11 p.m., around pub closing time. Here's the number if you were there, if you can help in any way, 01 811 Or you can call the incident room direct. That's on 0272 267 992. That's 0272, the code for Bristol, 267 992. Our next case takes us to Suffolk. Three months ago, on Saturday the 18th of February, late in the afternoon, after a day spent hunting for rabbits, Kevin Block and a friend decided to head for home. They were on the Earl of Stradbrook's estate, 12 miles south of Lowestoft. Oi, Toe, come here. At first, they thought they'd found a tailor's dummy. It turned out to be the body of 31-year-old Jeanette Kempton, known to friends as Jean. She disappeared from Brixton in South London two weeks before. This is Treherne Court on the Myattsfield estate in Brixton. It's half past eight on Thursday morning, the 2nd of February, the last day Jean was seen alive. Jean had been divorced for several years, but for the sake of their two children, her ex-husband used to visit frequently and often stayed there overnight. Did you see my sock? No. Come on, you two, get a move on. Bye, Mum, bye, Dad. See you later. Thursday was her ex-husband's day off work, and the pair of them went shopping on Brixton Road. Was it lager and light? Yeah, lager and light. Pint of lager and light as well. Jean was a heavy drinker, often spending whole afternoons in the pub. When they started drinking at about 12.30, they were the only customers in the Loughborough, but they were soon joined by a friend. All right. All right. All right, Chef. What are you drinking, Jean? Oh, lager and light. Jean's friend had come to cash a cheque for £300. Cheers. Here, look after this for us, Jane, will you? Yeah, all right. I'll only go and lose it. Can you give us a couple of quid till Tuesday? Yeah, all right, but I want it back Tuesday. Yeah, I'll give it back Tuesday. The purse and contents have never been found. Right. I'm going to go give the kids their tea. I'll come back and pick you up later. All right. All right. Ta -da. Ta -da. When he did come back, three hours later, Jean had gone. At six o'clock, her friend went with her to the Five Ways Florist, a few doors down from the pub in Loughborough Road. She was collecting a wreath for a funeral oh, next day. It's really nice. What do you think, Trev? Yeah, yeah, it's all, it's all right. It's really lovely. Cheers. Yeah. Cheers, darling. Oh, come on, you're not going to leave me now, are you? No, I'm not going to leave you. I'm just going home. You do what you want. Oh, 
finish my drink now. Come on, let's go down the uni. No, I don't want to go to the uni. I've had enough, G. No, I'm sick of it in here. Look, I want to go down the uni. Come with me well, down you, the uni. You go to the uni and I've had enough. I'm out of the game. At 7.15, they left the pub to go their separate ways. As far as is known, Jean never made it to the Union, nor any of the other pubs nearby. How did Jean make the journey from Brixton up to Suffolk? probably using the A12. And when she did so, was she alive or dead? This is the A12 at Wangford in Suffolk, a few hundred yards from where Jean's body was found. Three days after Jean's disappearance, two local residents noticed a dark-coloured rental van with smoked glass rear windows and an 01 phone number in white. What's somebody from London doing going down there? Leslie Fairs, an estate worker, saw a stranger's car drive through Park Farm. I was uh, mixing up cow food and uh, heard the car come into the farmyard. I hadn't ever seen the car nor the two people in the car before, so uh, I just walked out of the building further to get a better view as I disappeared into the distance into the estate. Two hours on at Church Farm, another resident was 400 yards from where Jean would later be discovered. Roger. Roger. By the time his wife had come down, both the screaming and the music had stopped. Twelve days later, Jean's body was discovered. John Saunders, how many of Jean's friends and acquaintances have you managed to trace? We've traced lots so far, but I feel that there are still people that we've yet to trace, and I would urge them to come forward and help us. Now, a lot of those clues that we pointed out in, in the reconstruction could be spurious. Those two vehicles, the dark van, the white car, and the screams, could all be quite unconnected with the crime. Yes, what we're particularly interested in, though, is who actually was in those vehicles. And as you say, they may well be unconnected, but we need the drivers of those to come forward for elimination purposes. OK, that's the dark van in Middle Barn Lane. That's the afternoon of Sunday the 5th, the that's white right. car Monday the 6th, about 9.30. And uh, whoever was larking about, if that's what it was, at 11.30 on, uh, on Monday the 6th. A lot of Jean's possessions haven't been found, the coat, the stiletto, Purse, very much like this. Of course, that very distinctive wreath that she brought in, yes. in Brixton. It might have been dumped somewhere. And jewellery, of which this is an imitation. This uh, ring with uh, a dark stone and imitation diamonds. This looks like it's got a sovereign in the, in the middle of it, this, uh, this bracelet. Yes, it has with a Britannia sovereign with the Queen's head on the other side. It's a gold 22 carat uh, gate bracelet. OK, and there are two plain gold rings. And obviously, yes. if uh, a jeweller or someone else has been offered that as a, as a group, it's, it's, it's pretty distinctive, isn't it? Yes, they may well have gone to a jeweller, a dealer, or a pawnbroker. People watching this, knowing the geography, may have uh, ideas themselves of somebody who might be implicated. You'd like them to call? Yes, certainly. Anything that they can tell us, obviously, will be treated confidentially. But now, Crystal Palace was playing Ipswich around the time that she disappeared. Yes, that was Saturday the 4th of February, just two days after she was last seen. OK, there might be just something in that. How are her two boys? Uh, obviously, they're young children, and uh, they are being looked after by relatives at the moment, and hopefully they're receiving the best care that they can. Well, if you can help, please call us straight away. The number here is 01811 8055, or as always, you can call the incident room direct. In this case, 0473 610610. That's 0473, the code for Ipswich, 610610. Now the first of our main cases tonight is the reconstruction of the last evening 18-year-old Michelle Waring was seen alive. 
On a warm September evening, Michelle disappeared after spending a Saturday night out with friends in Wigan. Our film begins at around noon the following day, Sunday, September the 10th, at Station Road Car Park just outside Wigan Town Centre. Oh, you're not going down there to that old handbag, are you? Oh, come on, the map, lean in. Oh, yeah, you're up. Right. Dad, finding handbag. Hang on, let's have a look at it. And we'll take it to the police. There's some shoes there as well. They might have something to do with this handbag. OK then, Mrs Waring, just to recap, it's your daughter Michelle Waring, 18 years. She's been missing since Saturday night, Sunday morning. Yes, that's right. OK, I'll get an officer round straight away. Bye-bye. This could have found property, please. Thank you. Yeah, um, this is where my son found the bag. Um, about two yards further on is where I find a pair of shoes. So let's just split up and have a look round. OK, then. Um, I'll go on this side and look round this way a bit. OK. Michelle had been missing for nearly two days. Over here. Her body was found in the bushes beside the car park in Station Road. Michelle lived at home with her parents and younger brother near the centre of Wigan. She worked as a waitress at a local cafe, and everyone who knew her describes a cheerful, popular teenager. On the evening of Saturday, September the 9th, Michelle and two of her friends had planned a night out. Michelle! She'd arranged to meet Sharon Pryke and Alison Humphreys in the town centre at half past seven. <laughs> OK. I have to my first. OK. OK. We'll talk about The three of them visited several popular pubs and bars in the centre of Wigan before finally arriving at Scott's Disco at about a quarter to ten. Michelle's friends remember her as her usual happy self that night, but towards one o'clock in the morning, she'd become tired. Oh, are you? Where are you going? I'm going home. Why? I'm fed up. I've had enough. Oh, don't be stupid. How are you getting home? Walking it. Michelle, get a taxi. Remember what happened to that man in Wigan? I'll be all right, honest. Promise me you'll get a taxi. OK. Anyway, I'll have to go now. I'll see you later. Bye. Ta As Michelle left the club, Alison and her boyfriend were already outside waiting for a taxi. Can you take us to Kit Green, please? OK. As they drove away, Alison saw her friend walking up King Street towards Wallgate. Where Michelle went next and exactly what happened to her, police can at present only speculate. Did she take a taxi on Wallgate? Did she accept a lift from somebody? Police need to hear from you if you saw her getting into a taxi or a car. Or perhaps she met up with somebody she knew who may have offered to walk with her the mile and a half home. One witness reports seeing a girl like Michelle standing next to McDonald's 400 yards from Scott's. She was with a man described as six foot tall, slim, with short blonde hair and wearing jeans in a light patterned jumper. Minutes after that, two separate witnesses saw a couple arguing outside the multi-storey car park at Station Road. One witness particularly remembers the girl's white shoulder bag. Several other people report hearing screams and shouts coming from the car park. The multi-storey itself was nearly empty by now. 
Was yours one of the few cars still parked there? And if so, did you hear or see anything unusual? At about half past two that morning, David Bradshaw was walking home down Station Road when he saw a young man near the exit of the car park. As David continued on his way, another young man, tall with short blonde hair, ran out in front of him from the entrance of the car park and up towards the town centre. And this was just 50 yards from where the following Monday evening, Michelle's body was found. Detective Superintendent John Smith is leading this investigation. What was the motive? I believe this to be a very violent, sexual, sexually motivated attack. Could there have been an incident at Scott's Disco, you think, leading up to her leaving before her friends and, and maybe leading on to this incident? Inquiries have not revealed any incident in Scott's. I believe that Michelle Waring was very tired and that is the reason she went home. If Michelle had decided, against her friend's advice, to walk home, what route would she have taken? She would probably retrace the steps she took in coming into Wigan that night. That's by walking back through the town centre towards her home in Welly. So, in fact, that car park would have been out of her way if she was walking home? That is correct, it would be, yes. It's about 800 yards away from the uh, disco. How far was that car park from Scott's? About 10 minutes' walk at the most, probably yeah. 8 minutes average. We can see there where Michelle was found. That is the, the star, yes. The entrance and the exit to the car park. That is correct, yes. That exit, a man was seen leaning over the railings, and you're particularly anxious to find him. Yes, I certainly am. I would very much like to eliminate this man from the inquiry and urge him to come forward. He's a young man, late teens, light coloured clothing, and he may well have been in that area of the car park for some length of time, maybe hours, prior to this particular sighting. If anybody knows this man's identity, please contact the incident room immediately. And someone else was seen near the exit at the entrance to the car park? That is correct. Uh, a man with blonde hair, about six foot, blue jeans, dark pullover, ran from that direction towards the town centre. And another sighting too around that time? Yes, that is correct. There was a couple walking along at Riverway with a dog when a man brushed past them, again a man with blonde hair. And again, I would urge these people, if they recognise themselves, to contact us on the incident room at Wigan Police Station. Now, those couples who were seen arguing, are you sure that they were Michelle or not? No, in fact, we're not. Uh, neither of the young ladies has been positively identified as Michelle, although both were wearing dark coloured clothing. The sighting at McDonald's, we know that the blouse that the young lady was wearing there was very, very similar indeed to Michelle's. But again, I would appeal to these people if they do recognise themselves as being outside McDonald's or outside the car park, I agree, please contact us. Could save a lot of vital police work there. It certainly it, would do. Incidentally, you may, to help you remember, Wigan were playing at home football against Northampton that night. That might help to jog your memory. Finally, briefly, there was a red car at the car park too, which might be significant. Yes, the Ford Orion was seen parked on Riverway by the multi-storey. The index number of the vehicle began with an E and ended with an E. It was quite a new car. Right, Mr Smith, for the moment, thank you. And of course, most importantly, if you think you may have seen Michelle herself in the small hours of that Saturday night after she left Scots, remember it was Saturday night, September the 9th, Sunday the 10th. Please do call us. Even the slightest piece of information could make all the difference in helping police work out exactly what did happen to Michelle that night. The number direct to the studio here is 01811 or you can contact Detective Superintendent Smith's colleagues at the Incident Room in Wigan on 061 855 7039. That's 061, the code for Manchester, 855 7039.